little after 10.30, so I will mute everyone, mute everyone now. All right, we'll begin with uh, a, ga a, ga a bit of gathering music. You heard this last week, but we thought it was so good we'd play it again. And we are. 
Good morning. My name is Andrew Mills, and I welcome you to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton online Zoom church service. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, multi-generational religious community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. Whether you have been part of our congregation for decades, or if this is your first time visiting, we welcome you. Whatever the faith and traditions of your past, we welcome you. Whatever your theological stance, we welcome you. Whoever you are and whomever you love, we welcome you. Whatever your heritage, we welcome you. We especially welcome any visitors who might be with us today and invite you to join us for conversation in the breakout rooms once the service has ended. We invite you to go to our online guest book, which you can find on the UCE website, uce.ca slash guestbook. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton, uh, sorry, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, home of First Nations, Métis and Inuit people over many centuries. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all our children. The end, you're muted. Good morning. I'm Leanne Washington, and I'm blessed to be the Unitarian Church of Edmonton's interim minister. Our theme for the month of November is healing. Today, we will be exploring the healing power of ritual through the celebrations of Dia de los Muertos, that is Day of the Dead, Samhain, and All Saints Day and All Souls Day all of which are occurring now from October 31st to November 2nd. The Day of the Dead was initially celebrated by Aztecs in central and <clears throat> southern Mexico about 3,000 years ago. Samhain was initially celebrated by Celtic pagans in the British Isles and parts of Europe about 2,000 years ago. And much, much later, All Saints Day and All Souls Day were declared by Pope Benefice IV in 609 AD in Rome. All three are ritual celebrations of life and death with special healing powers that we will explore. As we move into worship, I share with you words written by Alden Solovey. He wrote these words in an unrelated context. And yet they speak directly to our theme and today's exploration of these ritual celebrations. Salavi wrote, this is the season of healing, of healing our hearts and minds, of healing the moments we share with each other and the moments we share only with ourselves. This is the season of memory of remembering our parents and grandparents, the love of generations, the holiness of our ancestors. This is the season of turning, the season of grief turning to wonder and of loss turning toward hope. As Unitarian Universalist congregations around the world do, we start our sacred time together by lighting our chalice. Our chalice lighting this morning is a compilation of thoughts from two separate authors. We gather this hour by Christine Robinson and Flame of Fi Fire by Leslie Paul Kosvau. They will now be read by Jennifer Hinchcliffe.
We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, flame of fire, spark of the universe that warmed our ancestral hearth, agent of life and death, symbol of truth and freedom. Oh, what went wrong? Dying, which was once viewed as natural and expected and experienced at home, has become medicalized and separated from everyday life. Americans and Canadians have this in common. We live in a death-denying culture. We do not like to think about, talk about, or even acknowledge death as an inevitable reality. While logically we understand that we will die someday, it is generally a topic that is uncomfortable and swept under the rug. In a September 2017 article in the Winnipeg Free Press, Mike Goldberg, Community Outreach and Education Coordinator at Palliative Manitoba, said that we value youth and vitality over age and wisdom. So what happens when a person gets old and frail? Typically in Canada is that we tend to put them in senior care facilities, personal care homes. They age away from the home and they usually die away from the home and family. So we don't see our elderly and our infirm and we are often not present for their death. Our awareness of death and its consequences in our lives evolves gradually as we mature. It is thought that young children, some as young as two years old, can become aware of death as an ending. For example, when a pet dies or when they learn of the passing of a relative or a close family member or friend. Between the ages of three and six years, children can become conscious of the fact that their parents are vulnerable to death. And eventually children realize that they too may one day die. Death, they discover, is the supreme form of transiency. Everything eventually passes. Everything fades away and disappears. This realization is such an affront to a child's sense of security that the child will begin to suppress this realization. Without a healthy cultural response to death, existential psychologists Victor Florian and Mario McCullenser have observed that the paralyzing terror produced by the awareness of one's mortality leads to denial of death awareness and the repression of death related thoughts, eventually resulting in an unhealthy fear of death. Psychologists tell us that our fear of death is complex and involves three separate but related concerns. We fear the impact of death on our minds and bodies. We fear the loss of important relationships in our lives. And many, us, many of us fear what happens to our ultimate selves, our spirits or souls after death. Even those like myself who truly believe that what lies on the other side of the veil is an adventure at least as rich and rewarding as this one, will find moments when we perceive the imminent risk of dying and are afraid. But more than that, we fear the death of loved ones because we fear being abandoned, alone, and left with a life devoid of meaning. I'm convinced that modern people of European descent living in Western cultures would be happier and healthier if we stopped repressing our awareness of death 
and engaged in the form of healthy acceptance that our pagan ancestors knew. And we can always benefit from learning about such healing rituals from other cultures. The Celts and the Aztecs both believe that it is during these three days from October 31st to November 2nd that the veil between the living and the dead is the thinnest and that it is possible to speak to and feel the presence of deceased loved ones, which is generally thought to be a good thing. But in the song, Sow and Eve, Dom the Bard, a poet, storyteller, and musician, fears that when the veil between the living and the dead is thinnest, the taker of souls may come to take his. So he pleads, oh, leave my soul. Remember a death often depends on the circumstances of that death. To illustrate that reality, the Reverend Dr. Kendall Gibbons, a Unitarian Universalist minister, wrote our responsive reading, 
when death comes suddenly. With mics muted, please join in the responsive reading led by Corinne Jackson. When death comes suddenly, taking just one friend or in a magnitude beyond our com comprehension. In horror and disbelief, we remember. When a long life closes with honor and thankfulness. In reluctant submission and gratitude, we remember. When bereavement and loss seems to be everywhere, we turn and the world goes dark. In emptiness and pain, we remember. When it feels like nothing matters and life as it once was seems distant and unreal. In sorrow and numbness, we remember. When grief comes to us in waves and the help, helpless heart overflows. In sadness and aching tears, we remember. When communities come together and the hurt is shared. In mutual comfort and consolation, we remember. When a strain of music or a familiar image brings a gentle, wistful smile. In tenderness and nostalgia, we remember. When we come to honor those who have lost by learning, we have lost by learning to cherish more dearly those around us. In love and kinship, we remember. An important part of our community is sharing the joys and sorrows of our lives. If you have a personally significant joy or sorrow, please type it into the chat window at the bottom of the screen where we will be able to see it. Corinne will read them aloud. Your joys and sorrows will be part of our posted recording of the service. If you would not like to have your joy or sorrow, or sorrow available to the public, then you may also send your cares and concerns to candles at uce.ca. Um, Sheila says, I'm so incarcerated. Brian Sproul would have been 95 yesterday, a Halloween baby. We miss him. Jane says to everyone, with gratitude, I'm remembering my soul sister, Sal Salty, whose birthday would have been yesterday. Um, Susan says, happy to get a glimpse of Lynn Wolf. Maria says, booked for next week to teach grade one, two, greatly alleviating my financial, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> my financial worries for the next little bit. Gerard says, in remembrance of Stephen. <coughs> Susan says she has a new puppy. <clears throat> Another Susan says, for all my beloved dead, mom, dad, Winnie, 
Joanne, Molly, Piper, and others. <clears throat> Teresa says, remembering my mom, dad, and brother. <coughs> Donna says, another dear generous relative is turning 90 and still going strong. Shirley says, remembering the late Dan uh, Sarayan, whose birthday would have been today. Nicole says, and please let Biden win and let it be a smooth transition. Maureen says, I am concerned about possible violence after the election in the US this coming Tuesday. Let the hopes, let us hope sanity returns to our neighbors down south. Gertrude says, in remembrance of my son, Nathan, who died suddenly. Corinne, you froze while reading the last entry. Would you do that again, please? Okay. Um, Gertrude says, in remembrance of my son, Nathan, who died suddenly 25 years ago. Did you hear that? Yes, thank you. I light one candle for all the unspoken joys and sorrows held within the sanctuary of our hearts, and also for all those who have yet to find a spiritual home where they can share their joys and sorrows. Donna says, our condo building residents generously, generously give, gave food to the food bank and $250 from our bottle and can collection. Thank you, Corinne. Before I begin describing the three rituals occurring right now, I want to be clear that I do not observe any of them. I am not Catholic, nor have I ever been. I am not pagan or Wiccan. I am not from Mexican descent. That doesn't mean, however, that I cannot appreciate what these rituals have to offer or that I cannot adopt some elements of them for myself. Having said that, a word about cultural misappropriation is appropriate. What exactly constitutes cultural misappropriation rather than cultural exchange is a matter of some controversy. For our purposes today, cultural misappropriation is using a culture's or tradition's practice out of context in some different way or for some other purpose, such as entertainment or uh, ridicule or for purely fashionable reasons unrelated to the practice's original purpose. Adopting a culture's or tradition's practice in the same way and for the same purpose as adherents of that tradition do is not generally considered cultural misappropriation. Explor exploitation of another culture's religious and cultural traditions, fashion, symbols, language, and music, however, is. Today, we are engaging in an, in an appreciation for the healing qualities of rituals practiced by three separate cultures within their contexts. We are examining these three holidays in reverse order of their respective ages. 
The newest practice is All Saints Day on November 1st and All Souls Day on November 2nd. In Catholicism, a saint is someone who has led a life of heroic virtue. The process of officially becoming recognized or canonized by the Catholic Church is rigorous and far fewer people are canonized as saints than there are people who have lived a life of heroic virtue. So while many canonized saints are celebrated with their own individual day, such as say St. Patrick, saints that have not been canonized have no particular holiday. All Saints Day recognizes those who have attained heaven, but their sainthood is known only to God. All Saints Day is generally considered a holy day of obligation, meaning all Catholics must attend mass unless they are prevented by illness or other sufficient excuse. Although not a public holiday in the US, All Saints Day is observed publicly in many countries. In France and Germany, for instance, people have the work day off and businesses are closed. All Saints Day begins with a vigil. The nighttime hours of All Saints Day are devoted to praying and fasting. The Catholic ceremony for the day is a solemn one. It includes the observance of mass, followed by prayers offered to the Virgin Mary and all the saints. Within the church, the day is specifically dedicated to martyrs and saints with prayers and litanies offered for their faithful service to God. On All Souls Day, the faithful remember their loved ones who have passed away, pray for their eternal rest, meaning that any whose souls are in purgatory, which is a place of suffering where sinner souls are atoning for their sins before they go to heaven, are lifted by the prayers to heaven and call to mind, and the pray, people praying call to mind that they too will one day pass away. Catholics hope to live, believe, and even die like the holy saints who've gone before them. Likewise, they memorialize their loved ones who have passed on, but who live on in their memories. There are seven suggested rituals associated with All Souls Day. Morning prayers for deceased loved ones, lighting candles for them, placing flowers on their graves, taking a local pilgrimage to a significant place, for you, your family, and your deceased loved one. Sharing stories and looking at photos of past generations. Having a meal to celebrate the lives of loved ones. And evening prayers in which you individually name the deceased and ask for their continued guidance and intercession. Samhain is an ancient celebration of the end of summer a bountiful harvest and the beginning of a new year. It was a time of both death and rebirth as it coincided with the end of a bountiful harvest season and the beginning of a cold and dark winter season that would present plenty of challenges. Originally, it was a community-wide public festival during which it was thought that the veil between the world of the living and the world of the dead was its thinnest. So spirits of the dead are able to return to the earth and commune with the living. For those mis missing their deceased loved ones, this was a welcome time to remember them. But some people feared that not all the spirits who returned to earth were beneficent. So they prepared food and bonfires to appease and protect them from mischievous or malevolent spirits. Today, in most places, Samhain is no longer celebrated as a public community-wide festival, but it is celebrated privately by pagans as an opportunity to appreciate the turning of the seasons and to honor the loss of a loved one by communing with them. And ultimately, as a way to appreciate life. In my research, I found several suggestions for Samhain rituals. 
set up an altar decorated with harvest food, symbols of death, and pictures or mementos associated with your deceased loved ones and your ancestors. Include a candle that you can light while speaking your loved ones' names out loud and thanking them for being part of your life. Take a meditative walk in nature while contemplating the sights, sounds, and aromas of the turning season. Place a lighted candle in the window to guide the dead to the spirit world. Visit their grave site and place an offering there, such as fresh flowers, dried herbs, or fresh water. Take a pause and reflect on the events of the last year. Review journals, planners, photographs, and such. Consider how you have grown personally and how you met the challenges in your life. Hold a seance. Create a bonfire and write down an outmoded habit that you wish to end and place it in the flames to release it. Divine the future. Connect with others in your area to celebrate the cycles of life. One tradition which got my, entrench my attention was the Dham Supper. A celebratory supper for family and friends is prepared. A place at the table is set for deceased ancestors. Originally, the celebrants would eat their meal in silence, thus dumb supper, after stopping at the empty chair to recognize and honor the presence of deceased spirits. One participant in a dumb supper said that there's something weirdly relaxing about attending a ritual where no words are necessary. You notice things you ordinarily miss. Subtle gestures and expressions magnify our inner world when observed without words. And since there is no right way to celebrate a Samhain meal, some people include children playing games to entertain the dead and adults update their deceased family members on the past year's news. The doors and windows might also be left open for the dead to come in and eat cakes that have been left for them. I believe that Yvonne Miro has a picture that she'd like to share, or that I've asked her to share, of her altar. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, this is my altar. And on it, I've, I, it's mostly an altar to my beloved dead. And I do this every Samhain and just invite them in to hang out with me. And I have to say, last night, it seemed very busy in here. And I, I just had the sense of a lot of presence of spirits. And this often happens to me when the veil is thin, not necessarily on um, Samhain, but a day around there. So I have, of course, my, my basic altar elements, you know, um, a yellow candle in the south, rocks in the north, um, seashells in the west and um there's an egg i don't know if you can see it very well it's a crystal egg it's very clear and that represents air in the east and then my candle in the center i've got pictures of um my parents and an opal that was my mother's i've got um my my last dog, Molly, I've got pictures of her and I've got a box of her ashes. And in the corner left, you can see there's a book written by someone who was very significant to me, uh, Winnie Tom, who was my women's studies professor. I've also got many pictures from mass cards um, or, uh, you know, celebrations of life cards uh, just to help 
call everyone to mind and let them know that I haven't forgotten them. Thank you, Yvonne. Through these rituals, pagans experience death as a normal part of the cycle of life found in nature and in their personal lives. They don't fear death, though, like anyone else, they feel the pain of separation from loved ones. And that pain is lessened somewhat through its expression and the knowledge that in another year's time, there will be an opportunity to connect and commune with deceased loved ones. The Day of the Dead is the oldest of these ritual celebrations that honor the ancestors and celebrate the living. It's a Mexican holiday in which family and friends gather to pray for and to remember friends and family members who have died. Day of the Dead festivities unfold over two days in an explosion of color and life-affirming joy. While the theme of the celebration is death, the point is to demonstrate love and respect for de deceased family members. In other words, one's ancestors. Day of the Dead originated several thousand years ago with the Aztec, Toltec, and other Nahua people who considered mourning the dead disrespectful. For these pre-Hispanic cultures, death was a natural phase in life's long continuum. The dead were still members of the community, kept alive in memory and spirit, and during Dia de los Muertos, they temporarily return to earth. The centerpiece of the celebration is an altar or ofrenda built in private homes and cemeteries. These aren't altars for worshiping, rather they're meant to welcome spirits back to the realm of the living. As such, they are loaded with offerings, water to quench thirst after a long journey, food, family photos, and a candle for each dead relative. If one of the spirits is a child, you might find small toys on the altar. Marigolds are the main flowers used to decorate the altar, and the smoke from incense transmits praise and prayers and purifies the area around the altar. Throughout the celebration, one sees many calaveras or skulls. They are visual images of skulls. People decorate their heads as skulls and sometimes their bodies as skeletons and sugar skulls are sold as a sweet treat across Mexico. Families visit the grave site of their loved ones, clean them, erect an altar and leave food but not until after the family has enjoyed a picnic meal by the gravesite. Day of the Dead is a holiday to remember loved ones by sharing a meal with them as one would when they were alive. A traditional celebratory food is pan de muerto or bread of the dead. It is a sweet bread decorated with bones and skulls, sometimes arranged in a circle to denote the circle of life. One of the strongest and most recognizable symbols of the Day of the Dead celebrations is the tall female skeleton wearing a fancy hat with feathers. In the early 1900s, a popular cartoonist, Jose Guadalupe Posada, drew and etched skeletons in a satirical way to remind people that they would all end up dead in the end. It's, it is said that he drew the dandy looking female skeleton with a fancy feathered hat because some Mexicans had aspirations to look wealthy and aristocratic like the Europeans at the time. A satirical drawing to remind people to be themselves and to stop trying to be something they weren't was what he was intending. No matter how rich or poor, poor you were, no matter the color of your skin, and no matter what society you belong to, you would all end up skeletons. This was Posada's message, which has been incorporated into the Day of the Dead celebrations. My friend Maria Barrera has provided us with a picture of her altar, and she's here to describe the significant elements of it. Maria, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, am I on mute? 
Yes. Okay, good. This is all new to me. I don't do Zoom. <laughs> so it's my first try. <laughs> anyway, uh, everybody does a different altar. It depends on you. My altar is based on not only my family, but also all of the traditional elders that I work or um, I do a lot of prison ministry for Native Americans. So a lot of the work from the brothers and sisters behind the Iron House. And it has elements of everything, the feathers, the herbs, the rocks, the shells, um, the different um, barks from trees. Uh, when I do the sun dance ceremony and the sacred tree that I dance with, I have some of that bark with me. <laughs> and um, candles and pictures of um, all my relatives who have crossed over or other uh, brothers and sisters from the uh, Iron House that have crossed over to the spirit, spirit world. I usually put flowers, I put drinks, I put food, um, and um, I can't do this in an apartment as to my entrance, but my balcony, I decorate it all with the flowers and the candles towards the uh, entrance of the door and so the spirit and I open the the door for the whole day so the spirits can come in and I set up food for them too. Uh, growing up being part Anahuac from Mexico and Nambe Pueblo from New Mexico uh, I was always taught that uh, the skeleton is not something to fear because this is somebody who, when I see a skeleton to me, I see love, love of the person that it was, love of the person that share their wisdom, their joys, their love with me, love of who cross over and love of the person who once they cross over are nurturing mother earth as it nurtured him. So when Leanne the first time came to my house and saw a lot of my skulls and everything, she was a little bit scared about it. And she was wondering if staying in my house was a good thing. And I said, you know, we have a different way of seeing death. For us, death is something beautiful. And for you, it may not be when we have a child, we in our community have a funeral for that child because we believe this child is going to go through life and experience joy, pain, sorrow, discrimination, hatred. But once you're dead, you are now at peace and going back to mother earth and to rejuvenate her as she rejuvenated us. So, I wanted to share a little bit of my uh, skull and later on in the group, if you have any questions, I'm going to stay around and I am welcome to answer as much as I can. Thank you very much for allowing me to um, spend the day with you and I love Canada and hopefully in the future I can go and visit your congregation in person. Thank you, Maria. A ritual is any interaction that is repeated, coordinated, and emotionally resonant. Outside of our routines, which many consider to be ritualistic, true rituals are specific events that bring unity and connection into our lives by helping us connect to a higher purpose or larger goal or find deeper meaning in the events of our lives. Rituals can be very grounding, particularly during times of change, which of course includes all of life's passages from birth to death. Rituals also help us to make sense of and feel grateful for what is in this present moment. 
While each of these three holidays are distinct in their practices and rituals, which are particular to their respective cultural contexts and theological views on death and dying, they do have some aspects in common. Like any good ritual, there's an annually repeating time of the year for individual and communal recognition of the inevitability of death and for experiencing the emotions associated with grieving that are sometimes rep repressed and subjugated by the need to carry on meeting the expectations of our death defying or death denying society. They create a cultural expectation that the deceased are worthy of honor and that they no longer are with us in person, their influence in our lives continue. They involve gathering together family and friends who can support each other in times of sorrow. They also serve to remind one who is grieving that despite their loss, there is still much in life to be enjoyed and to be grateful for. It is the placing of death in context and balance with the rest of life and the giving oneself permission to express emotions associated with death that are often suppressed that make these rituals so healing. Through these rituals, death is experienced as a normal part of the cycle of life found in nature and in our personal lives. Death is no longer feared, though the pain of separation from loved ones continues, that pain is lessened through its expression and knowledge that in another year's time, there will be an opportunity to connect and commune with deceased loved ones. Our next song, Breaths, number 1001 in the Teal Hymnal, suggests that our ancestors can be found in nature and in us. Please enjoy this unique arrangement of an otherwise well-known song by Dr. Glenn Thomas Rideout, Director of Worship and Music at the First UU Congregation of Ann Arbor. Listen, 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 more often to think than to be. Tis the ancestor's breath when the fire's voice is heard, in the voice, in the voice of the water. Thank you. 
Generosity is a spiritual practice, one that enlarges the heart and lightens the spirit. For no matter how much or how little we have in the sharing of it, both the one who gives and the one who receives are blessed. We are a self-governing and self-supporting community. We rely on your support and your donations to maintain our building, support our staff, and offer our programs. Now more than ever, we need your financial support. Please visit our website at uce.ca to find the donation method that best suits you. For the month of November, we encourage you to also support the CBC Edmonton Turkey Drive. Please visit their website for more information about them. <laughs> to all three rituals that we discussed today is the idea that we remain connected to those loved ones who are deceased and to our ancestors. One way that this connection is expressed is in the idea that we are, in fact, our ancestors' dreams. We are the fulfillment of their wishes, their desires, and their hopes. With mics muted, please join in singing hymn number 1051, We Are. Ooh. 
As we bring our time together to a temporary close, I want to acknowledge and thank those who have helped to make our service today possible. Andrew Mills, our slide creator and slide runner. Our recorder, Ruth Marriott. Our host and greeter, Jeff Bizance. Our backup, Karen Belita. Our breakout room host, Lynn Turvey. Our readers, Corinne Jackson and Jennifer Hinchcliffe. And our cultural interpreters, the Reverend Dr. Maria Barrera and Yvonne Miro. Another thing that each of these celebrations have in common is the way that they are ways for us, the living, to show our affection for those who are no longer with us. In the performing of various rituals, we are offering our time and attention to the memory of those we have loved and lost. Locating the pain of loss within the boundaries of these designated days eventually allows us to live the rest of the year more freely. Not that we forget them, or that we feel no pain, but that each time we engage in these rituals, the pain lessens and our life without them begins to once again hold its own meaning and satisfaction. We honor them by being the best version of ourselves that we can muster and by leaving the full, living the fullest life available to us. And if we're lucky, we learn that the love we shared with those no longer with us is not diminished but is rather multiplied by sharing it with others. In honor of our um, chalice oh, extinguishing yes. will be read by Jennifer Hinchcliffe. In honor of those we have known and loved in the past, we carry the memories of the gifts, loves and beliefs from their lives in the sincere hopes that we may be worthy of their memory. We extinguish this light, we give our thanks, and we offer our blessings. With mics muted, please join in singing our closing song, Carry the Flame. our worship service this morning. Please feel free to take a three-minute comfort break or watch our weekly announcements as they slide by. In about three minutes, you will be randomly placed in breakout rooms for coffee and a chat. Maria and I, and Yvonne, if she will uh, agree to it, will uh, stay in the main room so that we can have further conversations. You are free to decline going to a breakout room, or you may go to a breakout room for a while and come back to the main room when you're ready. We will stay in the main room for up to an hour. 